Hello, I'm JW, and in a previous video I had a look at this uh, large yellow book here, the BS7671 Wiring Regulations. Uh, this amendment coming into effect later on this year, that's 2015. And uh, to go with this, there's a small yellow book, which is this one here. Uh, see it's far bound there with uh, considerably smaller and uh, fewer pages. And uh, we'll have a look at this one and see uh, what changes have been made in there. And of course they should uh, correspond with the changes in the large book. Now here's the uh, publication, and as you see it's a much smaller book. Uh, titled the on-site guide and okay, there have been uh, several previous editions of this with the corresponding cover to match the regulations at the time and of course this is the one with the amendment 3 uh, effective from 2015 and uh, before we get into the actual book there is uh, a mistake inside the book so uh, this uh, errata page has been issued and uh, the deal is it's on page 125 and essentially the uh, table there b6 has some of the wrong uh, figures in it so uh, that was the amendment and this is basically the corrected version here so of course uh, that should be uh, put inside instead of what's in the book itself so uh, as you can see most of the figures were uh, actually completely wrong certainly at the uh, bottom edge of the table so uh, that's uh, certainly an issue and I believe this uh, same table is actually reproduced in another publication the uh, guidance note 3 so if you've got one of those with the uh, new edition again this uh, needs to be corrected in there so this happens to come with the errata in it, but uh, you can actually download and print this out if you don't have that particular one. Now inside again we've got the hologram in the corner, just to prove that it is actually the uh, genuine article. And inside here the uh, content is of course based on the uh, regulations itself, and it's in a more sort of uh, compact format and obviously leaves out quite a lot of stuff which uh, might not use all the time. And let's have a look first of all to see uh, what we've got inside regarding the metal consumer units. Now this regulation is one that uh, states that consumer units must be made of a non-flammable material and the example given in the main regulations is ferrous metal as in steel. But of course that doesn't necessarily mean that steel is the only option though uh, as we saw previously it seems to be that most of the manufacturers are going down that route. So uh, let's see what we've got in here. Uh, no here we've got in blue the actual regulation number in the main regulations that this applies to, so it's 411201. And again, this is just a copy of that. It's uh, where a consumer is installed in domestic or household premises, domestic garages and outbuildings. One of the following applies. The enclosure is to be manufactured from a non-combustible material, or the consumer is enclosed in a cabinet constructed from non-combustible material. And again, that's uh, effective from January next year, although of course you can... Uh, comply with it before then and ferrous metal as in steel is the example. And the important point here is that uh, plastic enclosures manufactured from 960 degree glow wire rated material would not be classified as non-combustible in the context of this regulation. Now this is quite interesting because certainly the uh, one of the manufacturers I uh, pointed out in the previous one did have a consumer made of plastic which complied with this and they were claiming that it was compliant. But of course here we are this is now saying that that is not applicable so uh, that's certainly an issue if you're uh, basing it on a plastic that meets this particular specification. Now the second point here, which uh, is just uh, described here, is when you've got a steel consumer unit or other metal on a TT system, of course the uh, fault impedance there is going to be very high compared to a uh, TN type arrangement, typically in the sort of 50, 100 ohms or even more. And the uh, overcurrent protective device here, as in the cutout, is the supplier's fuse, typically 100 amps would be a fairly ordinary value. And as it says here, if the uh, incoming tails became loose or were damaged, in other words the line is shorting onto the metal enclosure, you've got to have enough current flowing to cause the protective device or fuse to blow. And certainly if you've got a say, earth rod in the ground with the same impedance, even 50 ohms, there's no way that a 100 amp fuse is going to blow there. And of course it's going to create that dangerous situation where the consumer unit casing is live. And of course most of the metal work in the installation is going to have dangerous voltages on it. So, um, as it says here, the uh, IET Wiring Regulations Policy Committee advises the following. So, consideration should be given to the uh, selection and installation of a Class 2 metal consumer unit on a TT system. And this would uh, presumably go along the line of that uh, plastic gland assembly, which I had a look at in the previous video. That's actually made by Wilex. And the consumer unit must have been validated and non-combustible using the appropriate test method. And of course, the main point being that the metal enclosure does not make contact with any line conductors in the event of an internal fire. Clearly, just shoving the uh, tails in and allowing them just to sit where they like isn't going to be an option because uh, obviously that could be sort of short onto the internal casing if there was some overheating or fire inside. And option B we've got is a class 1 metal consumer is installed 
and each outgoing circuit is protected by an RCBO. Now that's fine because uh, that of course would uh, prevent any faults on the outgoing side of the circuits from uh, causing a fault, so whichever circuit it may be that say just shorted onto the metal casing, the RCBO which is based on RCD and circuit breaker combined would disconnect the supply avoiding that problem. Of course that doesn't help you on the incoming side. And C, at a split class 1 metal consumer is installed where the double pole main switch of the consumer unit should incorporate a S-type or time-delayed RCCB or RCD. So again that would cover the uh, whole of the outgoing circuits. So those are fine. They would obviously uh, remove the issue of uh, wires shorting onto it, certainly on the outgoing side. And that would just leave the incoming wires from the supply, which of course would just go into the enclosure and then straight into the incoming device main switch or whatever else you've got there. And there's a note here which is about if you use all RCBOs, because of course in that situation the incoming side of those is not going to be protected against faults between the uh, live bus bar and the cating. But as it says here, the uh, instances of that making contact with the ferrous enclosure is actually going to be very unlikely because it's a rigid bar and it's secured in position into each protective device, so it's highly likely to actually become loose or fall out and cause a fault. And another issue here is that in split consumer units, those with sort of two RCDs and uh, possibly other devices in as well, the cabling between them is normally flexible, just single insulated, and of course it's very likely that if there was a fire or overheating inside that those could actually short onto the metal casing, and again beyond the incoming side they wouldn't actually have any RCD protection. So we've got that same problem with the fault impedance being far too high to cause the fuse to fail. And the suggestions here which are uh, connected to the applicable regulations here shown in blue. A lot of this is fairly common sense but uh, it certainly is uh, worth considering in terms of uh, metal consuming it. Uh, the incoming tails need to be protected to avoid mechanical damage and disturbance. Again to avoid it becoming uh, disconnected or damaged and making contact with a metal enclosure. And the entry point of the tails should maintain the fire protection of the consumer unit as far as reasonably practical. In other words, it will be uh, completely enclosed, you're not going to have big holes there. And obviously in the top case it's going to have to have the uh, compliance to uh, IP4X anyway, as that's uh, say one of these uh, regulations here. And the meter tails also need to be protected to avoid any foreseeable damage. And of course they must enter a first enclosure through the same entry point, not through two separate holes. Though in a previous video I saw that the overheating issue on say up to 100 amp supplies is not actually that significant, but uh, nevertheless the regulations do require that. And this particular part really is obviously what the manufacturer had seen prior to this being published, and the fact that the non-combustible enclosure includes the base cover door and any components, including hinges, covers, screws and catches. Devices and blanks are contained within the non-combustible enclosure, and therefore do not have to be manufactured in non-combustible material but the uh, use of non-combustible blanks is not precluded. And as we've seen, the uh, manufacturers so far have generally had a metal cover over the protective devices, of course those being made out of plastic, as they always were, so that the uh, cover being closed means you've got a completely metal covering over the entire lot. And then finally we've got an issue which really uh, confirms the substantial problem with this, in that uh, if a consumer unit is located in an external non-habitable building, like a garage or a shed, which is not in close proximity to a dwelling, and that's a fairly unlikely set of circumstances, but uh, consideration should be given to installing a consumer unit of non-ferrous construction, as in plastic. Presumably if the fire occurs there it's not going to uh, cause a fire in the house. And uh, the term not in close proximity is always a moot point, and the decision to install it must be supported by uh, documented risk assessment and uh, obviously noted on the electrical installation certificate. Now fine, if it was in a uh, detached garage, for example, or so, so several metres away from the main building, then yes, a fire there wouldn't actually affect the main dwelling. But the reality is that uh, if you're going to have a consumer unit in your house, it's going to be in the house, or in an attached garage or integral garage, it's fairly unlikely you're going to have one in a separately detached building, and then have all the circuit cabling from that uh, over to the main building and some kind of underground ducting or overhead connections. So. Uh, doesn't seem entirely relevant to put that in as that's a extremely unlikely scenario. Now of course all the information in this book is uh, in theory contained in the main regulations, but uh, the difference with this one is it's laid out in a more sort of practical fashion and uh, certainly contains more sort of examples of how things are actually done in reality, whereas the main book of course is uh, entirely considered with the theory of things. So uh, we'll just have a quick look through and uh, there's the uh, sort of contents section there. 
An example of the more sort of practical arrangements, you've actually got these sort of coloured diagrams, uh, for example, showing the uh, electrical supply coming into a building, and uh, there's similar ones to these on my uh, website if you uh, want to see those in a bit more detail. And again, it goes into uh, rather more sort of the practical arrangements of various scenarios which you may come across. Sections are uh, sort of broadly in line with the main regulations. Again, we've got a section on here on protection and the uh, disconnection times. There's an entire section on earthing and bonding. I'm not going to go into that in this video, but uh, I'll do another video in the future on uh, those two topics. That's, uh, they're uh, frequently confused, although there's only a few pages in there. It can go into a lot more detail than that. A little bit on isolation switching there. Uh, labelling, which is uh, quite a handy section because it gives some actual examples of what uh, various labels should actually look like. And whilst those are in the main regulations, they're not uh, actually printed in colour. And of course, this is sort of examples of uh, real labels that you would use in the real world, as it were. And uh, section 7 is actually quite a useful one because uh, it gives a whole list of various circuits. Now, of course, uh, if you're going to install a new circuit, you could design it from scratch each single time and uh, spend a considerable amount of time working out the proper cable sizes and the length of items and how many accessories it's going to supply and so on. And of course, all that depends on the type of supply you've got and the uh, type of protective device, whether it's an RCD or not, and various other factors. But of course, for a lot of the time, it's not necessary to do that because uh, certainly in domestic properties, you're going to have a very similar type of circuits in pretty much each property. And uh, what this has is a whole example here of uh, many different circuits which you would typically find. So so for example here we've got uh, ring final circuits, uh, something that we're going to use in the UK. And then lighting circuits here. And again, just a new one with uh, radial circuits of uh, again, various ratings, different protective devices. Again, different installation methods and uh, sizes of cables using. And again, you've got your maximum uh, length in metres of the circuits over here for different types of supply. So in many cases, it's not necessary to uh, individually work out a particular circuit because, uh, say, certainly in uh, domestic and uh, smaller commercial premises, it's almost always going to be one of these types of circuits. So uh, you can simply uh, look it up in here. And as long as it complies with the say, maximum distances here, not a problem. And there's quite a number of these. They go on for a number of pages there. So it does obviously continue on the other side as well. Now section 8 is about locations containing a bath or shower and uh, if you know uh, anything about the regulations you'll know that there are zones which you are allowed to put certain things inside. And we've got some uh, colour diagrams here indicating the zones and typically it's uh, zone 0 in the basin, one is above the bath at a height of 2.25 metres and then zone 2 is the same height but up to uh, 0.6 metres away from the edge of the bath. And again, if it was a shower, the same would apply. It's just from the edge of the shower in that case. And notice here that uh, there's no zone around the basin. There never has been. And although plenty of lights and other items come with diagrams which indicate a sort of semicircular zone around the basin, they are completely wrong. There is no zone there. And say never actually has been. It's purely distances from the bath that we're messing about, or in the case of a shower, such on the lower section there, it's the distance from the shower that matters. There is no zone on basins. I've no idea why so many lighting manufacturers put a sort of semicircular zone around the basin. It does seem to be a fairly common thing that you uh, come across in the instructions, but uh, as you've shown here, no such thing. It simply doesn't exist and never did. Now, section 10 here is on uh, initial testing of installations, and it does actually give some uh, practical examples here of how the various tests are carried out. I have done a couple of videos on some of these already, and I will do a whole set of those on all of the other ones that are not done so far. So uh, I'm not going to go into a huge deal on this, this particular occasion, but again, suffice to say, it does give uh, nice coloured diagrams of the various tests that you should be carrying out, and of course the uh, reasons for doing so. So I'm not going to go into that in uh, huge detail there, but uh, nevertheless uh, it is in there, and again that's something that, although it is in the main regulations, there's no uh, coloured diagrams in there, it's just more of a text description. I've covered RCDs in uh, various other videos already. Now we come to the various appendixes, and uh, there's quite a few of these, and in fact uh, if you look at the uh, thickness of the book there, there, sort of a third plus of the actual thickness of the book is taken up with the appendixes on uh, this side over here. And again these are quite useful just to look at things uh, fairly quickly. Uh, so actually maximum demand and diversity. 
the maximum permissible uh, measured earth fault loop impedance. So we're going to do a test on, say, an existing installation. Easy just to quickly look up the various uh, maximum figures. So rather than to uh, sort of calculate them out each time, all been provided there already to uh, obviously save a lot of time and bother. And of course, then we're coming to page 125, which is this one. And that's the one where the uh, rata page needs to be uh, just slotted in over that to uh, remove those uh, horrendous errors which were on that particular page. Now, appendix G is actually quite useful because uh, this is to do with uh, certificates that you would need to fill in after you've been completed an installation. And though these certificates again are in the main regulations, they are just sort of examples in there of uh, the blank certificates that you could use. Whereas in this particular book, you've got some information about how to uh, complete the things, and also some examples of ones which have actually been filled in. Let's say sort of a sample uh, electrical installation certificate there. Again, it continues on to the other pages, so it's giving you sort of practical information about how these things should be filled in. And again, I've got all the text there which will uh, assist in that. Again, that's the installation certificate there, and uh, again, description of the various tests and things which need to be done, and uh, obviously filled in on the relevant pages. Example of a minor work certificate there, which is used for, I say, just a small job. So, uh, example here, just adding uh, some lighting points to an existing circuit. Essentially, that's anything that wouldn't involve a new circuit being installed, just sort of adding or changing an existing one. And then you've also got an example of an electrical installation condition report. And that's just a report on an existing installation to see if it does comply with the regulations. And of course, if not, just list any sort of departures from those and uh, things that require remedial action. So let's look there at the on-site guide. And again, it has a bit of extra information there about those uh, non-flammable consumer units. And again, metal uh, does seem to be the route that people are going. But uh, of course, uh, some plastics may be acceptable, although uh, uh, so yet none of those have actually been seen which uh, definitely comply. Those plastic ones in the previous video apparently don't comply because the test that was referred to it is specifically stated in here as not being compliant, so uh, that just serves to confuse the issue somewhat. And if you've bought one of these already and it didn't come with the errata sheet, uh, such as this little one which uh, came with this one, you can actually download that and just print it out yourself. I'll put a link to that in the video description. And obviously you do need just to replace that table on page 125. And the same table actually appears in the Guidance Note 3, which is a, another yellow covered publication. And again, if you bought one of those, then again, do get that table and put that in there because the figures in the one in the book are incorrect. Now I haven't uh, covered much in the way of testing and uh, certain sections of this book. And the reason being that I'll uh, do some separate videos on uh, some testing and inspection ones. I've actually done a couple of those already. So we'll do those in a later video. But until then, thanks for watching.